Hey friends, let's take a moment and thank our sponsors because they make this podcast possible. Let's talk about a new sponsor, Revelo. Having a hard time hiring engineers? Revelo lets you sidestep the competitive U.S. talent market by helping you find and hire skilled remote engineers in Latin America. They only provide full-time senior engineers with over five years of experience, and they don't force you to pay for things you don't need, like a project manager. They charge a monthly fee, and you know exactly how much you're paying the engineers. They do the sourcing, they do the vetting, and you can interview the engineers before deciding. They'll manage all the paperwork, including benefits, payroll, and local compliance. And the time zone alignment is a huge win for U.S.-based teams, and it makes synchronous collaboration easy. Questions are answered quickly and effectively. To learn more, go to revelo.com slash Hanselminutes. That's R-E-V-E-L-O dot com slash Hanselminutes. And as a special limited time bonus, you can mention Hanselminutes and you'll get 20% off the first three months. That's revelo.com slash Hanselminutes. friends, I'm Scott Hanselman, and it's another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today I'm talking with Eden Wilson. She's a YouTube partner, a brand ambassador, she's a programmer in Python, she's created courses, and she was also Miss Chicago's Outstanding Teen in 2020. How are you, Eden? I'm great. How are you? I'm very excited to chat with you. Uh, I just realized something. Uh, you're 16, and this podcast is 17. So I am feeling quite old, because you represent the next generation of content creators. Yeah, it's kind of crazy that, that like... I see the, that YouTube is, it, it feels like YouTube is new and it's like that thing that Generation Z is doing, but y'all have been doing this for a long time. Like I was looking at your your YouTube channel. I'm like, I didn't even know all this stuff was going on back then. Like when I was in diapers, you were doing podcasts and talking to people and all that kind of stuff. Well, and I think when you were doing diapers, I met your mom at conferences and she was out there, you know, leading the charge too, uh, you know, with her summits and events and, and media as well. So I'm curious, was content creation and putting yourself out there and teaching people like just something that you always did because you saw your mom doing it? Yeah, I kind of carried on the torch. It started out with me doing sponsored videos with her because she's, since she's a mom blogger, I ended up doing a lot of the kids side of stuff, doing reviews for the kids products that she promoted. And she saw that I had a talent for speaking and doing video personality type stuff. So I started begging her for a YouTube channel. And eventually she gave in and Lemonerty was born. Then I have always been someone who's interested in coding. My channel was just about sharing the things that I like to do. So coding was one of those things. And I started sharing just what my projects did, showing them, trying them out, how to play them, stuff like that. Then I really got into sharing how I made them and seeing the impact that that started to make on kids around the world. That just made me want to keep going and got me more on the education path for my channel than just content creation because the most fulfilling thing is to hear a kid say, you're the reason that I started coding because kids are our future. That is the thing. Absolutely. That's exactly why I do it as well. Like sometimes when I do a, uh, uh, an episode and maybe one or two people listen to it and I, well, no one listened to it. But then I realized that those are one or two people who aren't me. So if two people listen to my video, that's double, right? And I could have changed one of those people's lives. So if I get a hundred or a thousand, then that's just amazing numbers. And I'm thrilled with those numbers. Exactly. Yeah. So it's called Lemon Nerdy. Yeah. Which means that it seems to me like when I was growing up, nerds were picked on and nobody wanted to be a nerd. When did your generation reclaim nerd and y'all are proudly nerdy? Or are you? I honestly don't think my our whole generation has adopted being nerdy, but I know I have. I I see nerd as a compliment. I see weird as a compliment. Like I call my friends weird all the time. That's like my way of saying, you know, you're great. You're like my favorite person. You're weird. I love that. So me being a nerd is it's I don't know. It's just me. I've always I've always been one and I've always been someone who is very confident in myself and I know that I am not exactly the coolest person on the planet and that's I'm fine with that. <laughs> Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of uh, celebs, though, that have also like decided that it's okay to be different. It's okay to be nerdy. And like I was, I was watching this show called um, Only Murders in the Building. Selena Gomez is unapologetically Selena Gomez. You know what I mean? 
And she's like being a nerdy geek and she's just being herself on social media. And it's endearing because it's like, oh, wow, you don't have a whole team of people trying to put makeup on you. and You don't have a whole team of people trying to make you polished. Like the whole kind of like celebs, they're just like us thing. I, I don't know. It makes people very, very accessible. And I like that we are reclaiming being a nerd or being a geek because it's about being a fan. How can you feel bad about someone who's really into something, even if it's not something you're into? Yeah. yeah, I think I think that's great. Honestly, I I follow people who feel like they could be just like me, like people who just share their passions. Like there's there's a a channel that my mom watches that's just decorating cookies, and you can tell that someone is they are so passionate about decorating cookies. And even if you will never actually follow any of these tutorials or make cookies or sew a replica of a Disney princess dress. You see them as somebody who is really, really into something, just like you're really, really into something else. That quality is attractive when it comes to content creating. Yeah, there's a phrase that I hear a lot of young people your age say that I have kind of claimed as well, which is, I love that for you. And if someone <laughs> yeah. is really into something, and it's, it's like you said, it's super weird. Like, and I'll be, and you know how TikTok figures you out? Like every day, TikTok is learning more about you. And if you mm-hmm. just like one thing, like I think I liked some kid got hugged by a Disney princess. And then somehow I ended up on like Disney princess cosplaying sewing machine TikTok. And then every couple of days, I'll just get some random person learning to sew and then they go and make a Tiana dress. And I love that for them because they're yeah. geeked about it. It's not my thing. But I think it's awesome. And I love that they found their thing. So with Lemonerdy, what you're doing is you've found your thing and you're sharing it with everybody. And what's great about it is it's coding tutorials and rhythmic gymnastics. And it doesn't matter that those things are not related. It's just who you are. Yeah. Yeah. So when did you know you were a programmer, though? Because you, 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 you did the content creation thing with your mom. But then at some point you figured out, wait a second, I'm a coder. So I actually avoided coding like the plague until I was about nine years old. My dad is a total coding nerd. He he loves all that stuff. STEM in general, that's his thing. I never liked math. Math was kind of the main reason I was trying to stay away from it because I know my dad liked math. He liked coding. They must be similar. I'm not into it. <laughs> He kept installing these little math apps and coding apps on my mom's tablet, hoping that we would get bored enough to try them. And then <laughs> one, one long car ride, I got bored enough and we didn't have any Wi-Fi that I tried out Scratch Junior. And I was like, hmm, I have no idea how this works. Not going to follow the instructions. I'm just going to figure it out because <laughs> I'm the kind of person I don't do instructions. I figure it out. And then if I can't figure it out, then I'll look at the instructions. So that triggered the problem solver in me. And then I realized this is something that I like that I would want to do. So I ended up using Scratch, which is like the elevated version, I guess. And I used that when I was younger. And I, I used that until I was about... 12. And then that's when I started doing my tutorials on it on my YouTube channel. And I've done some classes in Girls Who Code. I've done the Girls Who Code Summer Immersion Program. And then I'm taking AP Computer Science classes at my school. So then I started getting into JavaScript, Python a little bit. I don't really like Python that much because I, I I really hate that there's no brackets. It's, I have to mind the tab. It's so annoying. But my, my coworker is uh, Guido Rossum, who created uh, Python. So he's like the inventor of Python. So what? I, I promise I won't tell him that you <laughs> don't like his language. <laughs> yeah, I'm a curly brace. I like curly braces. Like they just they give me they're like nice and the code is here between the cur- curly braces. The whole Python white space thing is weird. Exactly. Like, you, if, especially if there are like certain editors, when you click on one curly brace, you can see where it ends and exactly. you can tell if you did it wrong. Yeah. Okay. I know Python is great. It's like the language that all the employers are looking for. And I will learn it eventually. But <laughs> it's just a little frustrating. Yeah. Well, the thing is, every language is great. Like you can be successful in whatever language makes you happy, which is cool because you're doing what's called block programming with Scratch. But you've mm-hmm. probably seen editors like, you know, Microsoft Make Code, where you do block programming and you can kind of like flip it around and say, here's the same representation of that code as JavaScript. You know, it just it just presented in a different way. It's all coding. 
as long as you can be successful and write a thing, it doesn't matter what language you used. Exactly. That's why I use Scratch specifically for kids to help them get into it because that's how I got into it. And it triggered the problem solver in me where I was able to get into it on a basic level. And then now that I'm older, I've been able to level it up, but it sparked that interest in coding for me. And I'm glad that I've been able to do that for other people. I can really relate with your dad. Like when you were describing how he wanted, like he was just leaving apps around and like sprinkling little bits of stem around the house just to like maybe the kids will just fall into this app and start coding you know and, and that on a, i was on a car ride where you're trapped for hours and you have nothing to do i guess i'll be a programmer okay <laughs> but but now you are now i read a thing on your mom's blog about your ap history and your, your ap computer science stuff talk to me about that because that's advanced placement you didn't take like basics you said basics aren't for me and you went straight into ap Yes. So I didn't take a computer science class my freshman year. I did film and video. And then I went straight into AP computer science principles, which is a beginner level course. I just wanted to get the AP credit and I wasn't going to be in intro to computer science where they're teaching me how to use Scratch because I'm teaching people how to use Scratch and that wouldn't make any sense. But then usually people go to intermediate after that because beginning computer science and AP CSP is they're kind of on the same level. And my teacher was like, most people are not going to be able to go straight from here to APCSA because it's a lot of problem solving, analytical thinking, and people that have gone straight from here to there have come back and been like, this is too hard or dropped the class because they just wanted to get some more AP credits. And my school is like that. People are just like piling on the AP credits. It's a very competitive school. And they're like, if I can, if it has an AP on the beginning of it, I'll take it. <laughs> but that's not how I am. I'm just very interested in computer science and I like a challenge. So people were going to the teacher of the AP computer science A class, This which is the most advanced class computer science class we have and getting rejected left and right. So of course I was a little bit nervous and my teacher was like, people that I'm sending that are really, really advanced are not getting in. But I decided to go for it anyway. And I showed him what I've been doing. I showed him the programs that I've been in and I did a test and he had me write out a program on paper in Python. <laughs> and because he was like, well, what language would you prefer to use? And I was like, I can use Python because that's closer to the language that we're going to use during the school year. And he was like, okay, try it in Python. And I knew I knew how to code it in JavaScript. It was, you had to create a list of numbers and then I think it was like reordering them. No, putting them in order, in number order, not using like a, an ordering function, but just like oh, putting them manually in sort them. Don't use yeah. that. You can't just go dot sort and go like, hey, AP. Yeah. <laughs> and then, but like exclude the number nine or something, or n- okay. the number 999 or something like that. And I did it right, but I accidentally created an infinite loop. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he told me that I did it right and I was able to explain my entire thought process very well, but I accidentally created an infinite loop and the computer would crash. But he figured that I I had it right and I because I had just placed the bracket in the wrong place. But see, the thing is, I wouldn't have known that because it was in Python. I wouldn't have put a bracket any, in there anyway. But yeah. if the bracket was in the right place, then it, it would have been right. But he saw that not just my skills, but my passion for it through me being proactive and asking for the placement test and showing him all of my things and not just taking no for an answer because I'm not that type of person. Mm-hmm. Did you think that that drive, that forward motion, that that came directly from your parents? Or do you think that you came built in with that, like not going to take no for an answer? I think part of it is from me, but part of it is also from my parents. My whole family is very, if it's not going to happen for me, I'm going to do it myself. My grandparents were immigrants and they came here and became doctors and lawyers. And my great grandfather, my dad's side, had a logging business in the South. So my family is very entrepreneurial and me personally. Sounds very driven. Yes, we're very we're very driven. And there was a song that I that I was singing. There were a lot of women empowerment songs that I was that I was singing while going through this process. I think there was that song I am telling you from from Dream Girls. Yeah. I was singing that one. I'm not going that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was singing that one. I was singing Strong Enough. Probably Jill Jill Scott Golden. 
is probably in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And Pat Benatar song, Hit Me With Your Best Shot. Yep, that was a that's classic. In. A classic. I'm a very driven person. My family's very driven. It's just kind of in my blood. So you're doing all of this, though. Here's the part I want to understand. You have the vlog. You have the coding tutorials. You're doing gymnastics. You're doing, uh, what are they called? Uh, uh, you, you, you were Miss Chicago, uh, Miss Teen Chicago, or something like that. What is that called? A pageant? Are those yes. pageants? You do have school. <laughs> when, <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, you, <laughs> I, I go there sometimes. It's not you're nice. still in high school. Like, do you have more hours than we do? You know, like uh, somebody was telling me that Beyonce has the same number of hours that I do. So, like, I should probably work harder. But she also has a whole team. Uh, so I don't. I kind of reject that whole thing of having more hours. Do you not sleep? When is all this work happening? Um, I actually have like a portal that I use. <laughs> and I just, it just cuts out the whole transportation time. Yeah. And I also, I, I don't sleep. I'm kind of like a robot basically. But no, I'm kidding. I, ooh, I don't really know. <laughs> Sometimes. Like, is this just like, every, like all weekends? Like you don't just hang out and watch Netflix, right? Do you just not ever hang out? Or are you just always making something, creating something? Because I'm trying to get the listener to understand like how they can do this stuff too. Because people will say to me, well, how do you do the job and the podcast and the YouTube? And it's like, well, how do you not? Like, I don't know how to not create stuff. And I wonder if you're the same. Yeah, this summer I have napped and watched Netflix because I've made an effort to not do all of the things that I've been doing so far because it it does take a toll on me. But during the school year, it's not as hard as it seems. I think getting into all of this stuff looks very scary and it seems like it's very daunting to get into. But gymnastics, that's three days a week, three hours, an hour drive there, hour drive back. And then my YouTube channel, while I was creating the course for DIY, I went on a hiatus for that. So I took maybe four days spread over two weeks to get up in the morning about 3 a.m. since I have a train track by my house. So I try to get into doing my videos before those start running. And I just recorded the videos. I would do like 12 at once. And then I got through all 26. And then that was done. So then it went to my mom to start editing them. And then the course is just out. So it didn't take up a lot of my time other than writing the scripts that did take a few months. But gymnastics, that's kind of in its place when in doing that, I'm doing that. Mm. I do need to work out more at home, but we're not adding things to my schedule right <laughs> no, now. No, that doesn't count. But are you like, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out because you're 16. My son is 16. Are you using Google Calendar? Are you using a piece of paper? Like, is this how do you keep track of all of this stuff? I use Google Calendar for all of my events, like meetings like this. I use Google Calendar. I have like repeating things for days that I have gymnastics. I use my school planner to write down my assignments. I have a Google Doc. I'm very proud of this Google Doc where <laughs> I use um, drop downs. I just have like a, a chart of, I think it's like a, I don't, I don't want to mispronounce it. It's not a, it's a Kanban board. Yeah, a cool? Kanban board. Yeah, that's right. Like it's like you've got doing to do done, and then you move things from left to right across the board. Yeah, it's something like that. So I just change it from like in progress to done, and then I order them. I put them in priority order. See, so, now you got to sell that. That could be a whole business, and then you'll make a whole business around selling uh, Eden's Kanban board for a dollar ninety nine. On <laughs> <laughs> that'll be a whole side thing. Hey, friends. This is Scott. I hope you're enjoying this chat. But we are going to take a brief break. And we're going to have a chat with our sponsor. Our sponsor, Raygun, today makes shows like this possible. My website is down for an hour every October for the last 20 years. And, <laughs> and at least I know it, though. You know what I mean? At least I'm aware. Like, I, yep. Raygun tells me the line number. One day I'll fix it. But <laughs> it's only cost me five hours of downtime over the last five years. I figure I'll, uh, you know, I'll put five hours of work into it in the future. Well, you, you hit on an amazing point that a lot of the things with these tools and why it's often better than a generalized logging solution is what actually matters and building a workflow where you can ignore some of the things that really aren't a big issue, you know, that you've you've triaged it and gone, you know what, not worth the time versus ones that actually this is costing us revenue or, you know, customer satisfaction. That's a great point. I've got one bug live on my blog right now. When you visit the directory of my uh, where my graphics are stored it throws an error. It throws an error in a static file handler somewhere. But you shouldn't be doing that. You're probably mm -hmm. poking around. It doesn't affect the end user. So I can go into Reagan and I can say, ignore this class of bug, 
I can snooze it, like hit the snooze alarm. And then I can worry about it later because it's noise. And that allows me to not just see my bucketed bugs, but really focus on the high priority ones, which is nice. Yeah, everything in in sort of crash reporting is about how do you improve that signal to noise ratio so that you can be as effective as you possibly can uh, as part of a high performance software team. That is what it's all about. I can send you a thousand log files and say, go and figure out what the right business decision is, but I can plug it all into Raygun and Raygun will tell you, here are the bugs, here's who they're affecting, here's how it's affecting them. You pick the ones that are high priority, you link them into your bug system and and go to town. It's fantastic. And folks that are listening can sign up at raygun.com. You can, you can have this experience in your software. You can find out where the hidden bugs are and you can decide to ignore them. Check it out, uh, trial at raygun.com. So you mentioned DIY. So DIY.org is a, another company. It's not your company. But um, how did they find you and how did you end up making a programming course for DIY? DIY.org is based in India and about half of my audience is from India. So my coding videos especially started to get more traffic from there. And I guess I think they said that one of their kids introduced them to it because I guess they're parents of people who watch my videos and they came to me and they were like, we want you to make the scratch course. And I got on a call with them. They talked about logistics and everything. And then they called me back later and said that they already had somebody else to do the scratch course. And I was a little bit disappointed, but then later on they called me back and they were like, okay, so we have someone doing the beginner course, but we want you to do the advanced course instead. So I was like, okay. Well, that works too. <laughs> That's crazy. Now, did you're in school, you're learning, you're spending time with teachers. How did you know how to make a course? Like, those are different skills. Sitting in class and getting A's is different than designing a course. You did 25 videos, 19 challenges. I assume you had to script the whole thing out. Did someone do that for you or is that entirely out of your brain? That was actually entirely out of my brain. I think I'm almost more proud of the scripts than the actual videos. I think the videos look great, but those videos, I spent countless hours making the scripts. It's like 17,000 words, which is the length of a small self-help book. (laughs) And I just divided it into the different parts of the game. And then I broke it up into what kinds of skills they need for each segment of code. So if they need to know how functions work for this specific video, then I would explain it in the beginning. Or if they need to know how to plan out how a game is going to work, like the objectives and how upgrading works and all that, then I would explain that in the beginning. So it's not like I'm explaining it while they're coding it. And I would have images. I would like take screenshots of the code and put it in my document to help me type it out. So I would just explain line by line each code. And it's not as hard as it seems like I'm, it's not like I'm creating a whole year long curriculum for Mm. AP US history. It's really just taking the parts of the game, breaking it down into small digestible sections, and then picking out what skills they need for each one. How did you know how long it should be? Like, how did you know when it was done? Well, the course was the objective was to finish making a pizzeria game. So mm-hmm. when the game is finished coding, is finished getting coded, it's done. And when I show them how to publish it, how to promote it, how to do their thumbnails and everything, putting the finishing touches on it, then it's all done. Mm-hmm. And that ended up being 25 videos, but it could have been 50, it could have been 10. You just really didn't know until it was done or you figured it out while you were planning it. I kind of figured it out while I was scripting it. I would just go through like what it takes to code the restaurant and then the kitchen and then the winning and losing and like the levels and all that. Then I would just say, okay, so now we're coding the customers coming in for the restaurant or drawing what the restaurant looks like and just breaking those pieces down. And then once I filled in those sections, then I was able to figure out how long it would be. And I, I kind of had to cut it down a little bit so it wouldn't be too overwhelming for the kids, but it ended up looking pretty good. There's a thing that happens to me, even though I've been, I've been programming now uh, uh, 30 years as of April of this year, and wow. I still get analysis paralysis. Does that What's sound like that? something you may have had? It's like when you, you know what you need to do, but it's, there's so much that you get overwhelmed. So then you freeze and you do nothing. Because there's so much to analyze, 
that you mm-hmm. just get paralyzed. Do you ever feel like there's just too much and then you you just stop or you just take take a little bite and just a little bit and a little bit and move forward? Because I'm a person with very big ideas. I think the biggest product that I ever did was a bookstore game. And that came out of pure like concentrated nerdiness because I love books. <laughs> I love bookstores. I get kind of crazy in bookstores. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to make a game where you get to own a bookstore. Mm. But I had so many ideas. I was like, okay, so you're going to be able to order books online. And the packages are going to come in. And there were like so many things to add to this, this game. But I think when you have the passion behind the project, mm. then the analysis paralysis kind of goes away because I was like, this is going to be huge. But then while I'm thinking that, I'm like, I'm just like, but I want to see how it's going to end up when it's done. I want to see how big it's going to be. So I just kept going and right. I would just kind of binge code. But another, something that I would recommend doing is I will make the functions for everything mm-hmm. and like everything that needs to be clickable. And I would make all the graphics first and then just fill in the code after that. So then when you're coming back to it, then you know everything that you need to do. And you're just like, okay, I'm going to fill in this function today, then this function, then this function. Oh, I appreciate that advice. So you're making the function names and kind of like keeping them blank, but you know the structure and you can see like you like it's like knowing the chapter name of a book. You haven't written the, written the entire chapter yet, but you know the name and you know where the book is going and you just want to see how the book ends. Yeah. That's cool. You should check out one of the episodes that I did on the show here with Bria Sullivan, who made a boba tea game and she quit her job at Google and now makes boba tea video games full time. Really? That's her job. I love boba tea <laughs> and I love video games. I will introduce you to Bria. She is actually on TikTok and she's making the boba tea game as her full-time job now and has a game studio. That's amazing. I I, I want to play the game. <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll definitely hook you up with that. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is there's a thing where people are saying we should always teach kids to code, but some people think that we focus too much on the lines of code and the syntax and the as you said, in Python, the indentation or the curly braces in another language. And we should teach them about systems, like the larger system in which things fit. Do, what, what do you think about that? Does that mean anything to you? Like one of the examples I give, I was doing, doing a thing at a, a local high school and I said, let's learn how to code. But instead of teaching them about code, I said, here's a toaster. It doesn't work. I really want toast. And they were like, what does this have to do with coding? And I was like, well, what's wrong with it? Let's debug this problem. So how would you debug? I have a toaster. I want some toast. I put the toast in and nothing happened. What what do I do? Well, I would check if it's plugged in and maybe how long you've had it. Because if it's one of those toasters from like Walmart, (laughs) that was like $10 that you got when you first moved in, you're like, I don't want to get an expensive toaster. So that's that's excellent. The first thing you did was you said, well, let's see if it's plugged in, which means you understand the system because electricity is the system outside the toaster. And then it's like, well, is it plugged in? Is the wall light turned on? Is the fuse popped? And then later on, you might go outside to see if the neighbors have power. Well, hang on. I just wanted hot bread. Why are you looking at the neighbor's lights? Because the toaster exists in a larger system. So it's like, if your game doesn't work, is your video card a problem? Are you out of memory? Is your hard drive full? And all of those things. So systems thinking is describing how all of these things fit together in the larger system. And I wonder, do they teach any of that in AP classes now? Or is it only that they teach you the lines of code to type? I think that they're moving towards teaching more of that. I think that's why Scratch is so great because you can think more larger scale mm. and you can just get things done and you can get more into the problem solving because that's what made me interested and that's what makes more kids interested because if they're able to just get into it and read things that they understand, Mm -hmm. then they'll be more likely to be like, okay, this is interesting. I can figure out stuff and I can make what's in my head happen. If they're imagining, I want to have a racing game and all these things. Like when I'm introducing different kids to code, they're like, I want to make a racing game. I want to make something like Roblox. They have these huge ideas and having something that it's not holding you back at all and you can just go for it. That's really good for, for getting kids into coding. Yeah, no barriers. There's a book, The Girls Who Code book. 
mm-hmm. they the way they teach it is exactly like that. They'll teach functions like your morning routine. So they'll say that if there's a function called like start morning, then you would get up, you would make your bed, brush your teeth, all that kind of stuff and relate it to real life. So it's more easy to grasp for kids. That's a really good example too. And that's a good example of the system, which is like getting up and going to school and doing, you know, all of the things that the system falls apart if one of those functions has an error or fails. Yeah. So uh, Lemon Nerdy is your website, lemonnerdy.com. Season four is out. Um, you're going to keep doing this or do you think you'll be podcasting and uh, doing videos for the next 20 years or are you going to take a break one day? I know that I'm going to keep doing it through high school. Not sure what's going to happen in college. I might just have a personal blog and podcast, but sneak peek, my uncle got me a new podcasting set and I think it's a sign. My mom has been on me about starting a podcast. So I think I might have one. Maybe you could be a guest (laughs) on my new podcast, but my YouTube channel is Lemonerdy. My website is www.lemonerdy.com. Season four is out. Season five will be coming soon before the end of the summer. So I will be back with more coding videos and you can access my course on DIY.org. Very cool. Thank you so much, Eden Wilson, for chatting with me today. No problem. It was nice talking to you. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week.